Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the council. Uh, we are moving on with our agenda, and we will now have a public hearing on Bill 323, Environmental Sustainability, Montgomery County Green Bank. This bill would make climate mitigation and adaptation a prominent focus of the Montgomery County Green Bank's mission and generally revise county law regarding environmental sustainability. A Transportation and Environment Committee work session has been scheduled for March 6th. Those wishing to submit testimony for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on March 1st. We have one speaker for this public hearing, and that is Mr. Stephen Morell. Mr. Morell, yep, if you would come on up. And you have three minutes when ready. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony in support of Bill 323, Environmental Sustainability, Montgomery County Green Bank. My name is Stephen Morell. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of the Green Bank. The Green Bank has been honored to serve the county in achieving its goals for greenhouse gas reductions and environmental sustainability. Our structure as an independent financial intermediary has turned public funds into a much larger pool of private capital, and that, in turn, has opened access to affordable and equitable clean energy solutions across the county. In just this fiscal year alone, we have been able to accelerate key impacts and outcomes, which were greatly energized by the first year of funds from the county's fuel energy tax. Our achievements include over 30 million in clean energy projects, 5,300 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions avoided annually, 3.8 megawatts of rooftop solar PV projects, and a leverage of $1.50 in private capital for every dollar of Green Bank capital committed. Moving forward, the Green Bank can and is willing to serve a larger role for the county in addressing climate change and helping the county meet its climate action plan goals. Specifically, the Green Bank can use its approach and its structure to support resiliency, sustainability, and climate adaptive infrastructure projects across the county, such as water management, resilient buildings, nature-based climate solutions, and others as characterized in the Maryland Resilience Authorities Authorization Act. Expanding the Green Bank Charter to include resiliency is smart for many reasons. We bring broad knowledge and skills in building the market around innovative financing techniques. We crowd in private capital and build a sustainable financing marketplace. We substantially increase liquidity in the market, including access to secondary market channels. We engage with all constituencies in the county, many of whom are overlooked by traditional financing sources. And as a resiliency authority, the Green Bank would leverage funding from federal, state, and other resources to meet the substantial financial needs of climate resilience. Bill 323 is an important step in accelerating the county's response to climate change and the Green Bank stands ready to take on this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This public hearing is now closed. Next is item number five, a public hearing on resolution to designate the Montgomery County Collaboration Council for youth, for children, youth, and families as the county's local management board for children, youth, and families. And HHS here committee work session is scheduled for March 9th. Those wishing to submit testimony for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on March 3rd. There are no, are no speakers for this public hearing and this public hearing is now closed. Next is item number six. This is a public hearing on expedited bill 423, administration, non-merit positions, special projects manager. This bill would increase the number of special projects managers in the office of the county executive and generally amend the law governing personnel in Montgomery County. A government operations and fiscal policy committee work session is scheduled for March 9th. Those wishing to submit testimony for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on March 2nd. We have one speaker and that is Mr. Rich Maddalena, the CIO. Is Mr. Maddalena here? I do not see Mr. Madalino. What I will do. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that was a great entrance, Mr. Madalena. <laughs> Thank you. I, I meant to have a little. I'll, I'll let you catch your breath before I we meant to have a little burst this. of smoke. <laughs> just appear so well thank you very much mr. president and members of the of the committee my name is rich Madalino. I'm the chief administrative officer for the county government I'm here representing a county executive Elrich with this bill to create a new non-merit appointed position Ca catch your breath it's in the okay. office of the county executive. we give you a little extra time it's okay <laughs> um, so uh, as we speak today the county executive, in fact, is in Washington for the National Associations of Counties meeting with President Biden um, at this moment. So one of the things the president is talking about is obviously the amount of federal funds that will be coming to the county, all counties and states, through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And those two bills provide us with the opportunity to access millions, tens of millions of dollars especially around digital equity and broadband. Um, this is a $2.75 billion um, piece of legislation just on the Digital Equity Act that will allow state and local leaders to get this once in a generation opportunity to expand um, broadband and other um, technology tools for people who have not had access to them. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration is expected to release state formula funding in the fall of 23, a total of $1.44 billion over five years is available for state digital equity capacity grants. Another $1.25 billion is available for the next five years for digital equity competitive grants. The NTIA has not announced a specific timeline for these grants, um, but um, the funding for counties will be passing through state digital equity capacity grants. Governor Moore's new administration is preparing to take advantage of this opportunity that is key to removing barriers that keep people out of the job market and out of a great educational opportunity. The state will draft a digital equity plan with measurable goals and objectives that will be tied to the Maryland's economic and workforce development goals and outcomes. Governor Moore has said he wants Maryland to be the most connected state in the nation, and obviously as the largest jurisdiction in the state, um, we, we will play a major role in accomplishing that goal um, for the governor and for the state. In the past two years, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County have all launched expanded digital equity initiatives. The new special project manager position will be Montgomery County's primary representative for coordination with internal and external stakeholders, focus on digital equity and broadband connectivity issues to expand public access for county residents. This position is needed now in order to take advantage of this unique opportunity, and that's why we're hopeful that you will provide, um, you will pass this bill quickly so that we can be prepared as soon as possible to get our plan ready, the coordination between the county government, the school system, other stakeholders, and deliver uh, a great opportunity for the residents and citizens of our state today and tomorrow. I realize my thank no, we, we gave you uh, a, a few extra seconds to catch your breath. Uh, appreciate it, <laughs> Mr. Manolino. Uh, Councilmember Ludke has a comment. Yeah, and I think you, you started to touch upon this, but um, the way the bill is drafted says that it's necessary for the immediate protection of the public interest. And um, as you just noted, sort of fall 2023 is one of the timelines you just talked about. You said there wasn't a timeline known for the grants as of, as of right now. And then you noted that other jurisdictions have already done this in the past. So is this a new issue for Montgomery County or is this a longstanding issue that, that is just being dealt with presently? So I'm, I'm trying to get to the immediate protection of the public interest phrase of the bill. Well, I, I mean, that is, as you probably know from having looked at emergency legislation at the state level, they all say for the for the, the health and well-being of the state. I mean, that, that's just the terminology that I think we are, that we are um, forced to use. Um, so 
Uh, we have a unique opportunity with this, uh, as I said, with the federal funds that are coming. I, I don't know if you realize this, if you've ever taken time to look at the State Department of Budget Management's um, website. Um, they have a report on the, all the um, American Rescue Plan Act dollars that mm -hmm. have flowed, mm -hmm. and the state still is carrying a very large mm -hmm. amount of unspent broadband money that is sitting there. Um, so there are opportunities waiting us today, especially with the new administration, to get in and access those, access those monies. So I do think even though the federal funds still have to flow, we've got to get our plans into the state, the state has to put their, their requests into the federal government, but there are pools of money that are sitting right now at, in Annapolis waiting to be, to, to be spent, and we should aggressively be going after that. And, you know, quite frankly, we haven't had someone at uh, the ability with the time, the bandwidth, no pun intended, to, to work on this issue in coordinating all the different people that have to be at the table. Um, the school system, components of county government, some of our partners in the nonprofit sector, using um, our partners in the business sector to, to make this work. So I think there is strong reason to move quickly on this um, and not wait until July 1st for, for the position um, to, be, uh, to be created and then filled. And of course, because this is, this is an appointed position, whoever gets this appointment will be back before you to discuss mm -hmm. in greater detail what, the, what he or she will be working on. And this is not something that could be filled um, by reclassification of someone else's in an open uh, position? I, I, I think the county executive's vision for this is you need someone who is on the second floor that has um, the direct access to the executive, to all of you, to the top decision makers at MCPS and other governmental partners in order to work on this. And that's why repurposing, repurposing another position, which, and the only thing we can do to repurpose another position would be to, <clears throat> change that position, go through that process, it would be a merit system position, we would have to put it out on, for, for anyone to apply, go through the selection process, and that would take far longer than this process, assuming you, you pass this bill in the mm -hmm. current format to move it along in an expedited manner. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Madalino, for the grand entrance. We'll expect that every time to show up at the council. Okay. Uh, this public hearing is now closed. Uh, this public hearing is now closed. Okay. Uh, Give me a call. Next item, number seven. This is a public hearing on our resolution to approve executive regulation number 2422. Special Projects Manager Class Specification. A Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for March 9th. Those wishing to submit testimony for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on March 3rd. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and this public hearing is now closed. Item number eight, this is a public hearing on Expedited Bill 523, Personnel and Human Resources prospective employees' health care privacy. This bill would limit inquiries by the county regarding certain health information of prospective employees, prohibit inquiries by the county regarding certain reproductive health information of prospective employees, limit consideration by the county of certain health information of prospective employees, permit certain appeals to the Merit System Protection Board, and generally amend the laws regarding human resources and health care privacy. A Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for March 2nd. Those wishing to submit testimony for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on February 24th. We have two speakers for this item, one in person and one virtually. First in person is Ms. Melissa McKenna. Good afternoon. I didn't expect to see you all again so soon. 
Thank you, Councilmember Lutke, for calling attention to this Arcane County practice and introducing this expedited legislation to take effect immediately upon passage. Thank all of you for supporting Bill 523, ending the county's collection of protected health information. That the Montgomery County Government Medical History Review Form was updated less than a year ago and is still being required for employment is beyond words. Frankly, I'm shocked it hasn't been legally challenged before now. The potential for bias against hiring based on the answers on these questions is vast. Make no mistake about it, protected health information is being collected. The county government is not a health care provider and has no business requiring this information. I wholly agree that prospective employees only have to answer business related questions as to whether they are able to meet published minimum job qualifications. Judging anyone's fitness for a job should be made by an outside entity and only the results, meaning yes or no, the person can perform the job, be reported to the County Office of Human Resources. It is vital that protected health information be shared only with the healthcare entity that has the correct and necessary HIPAA policies and protections in place. It's not just a matter of reproductive health information. This is a disability rights issue. The disclosure of any disability is voluntary. People with disabilities, especially those with invisible disabilities, by their answers are forced to, con to disclose their condition. The potential for misuse, abuse, or bias of the provided information to evaluate an individual's future eligibility for disability or disability retirement benefits is enormous, and the termination should be made by a third party. In addition to this legislation, I ask please change the county practices to outsource determinations regarding physical fitness to meet essential job requirements and short and long-term disability. If health information is used with any of 18 identifiers, I've circulated that for you, it is considered identifiable and therefore protected health information. The county medical history form requests and contains 16 of those 18 identifiers. As part of a personnel file, this leads to extended distribution and protected health information becomes individually identifiable health information and absolutely subject to HIPAA privacy protections. I would go a step further, please, and request that this bill also mandate the purging of this information of current and past employees from all personnel files and electronic records immediately upon passage. Finally, the bill should specifically include the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 um, definition of terms such as protected health information, individually identifiable health information, and health information to, to conform to their definitions. There's nothing worse than someone you don't know knowing your health background, and by the way, people will treat you differently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McKenna. Uh, joining us virtually is Ms. Amy Millar. Uh, thank you, council members. Um, so good afternoon, again, my name is Amy Millar and I'm testifying on behalf of the members of UFCW Local 1994, uh, past, present, and future, who have been required to answer often invasive healthcare questions on job applications for the county. Uh, we wholeheartedly support Council Bill 523, um, Personnel and Human Resources Perspective Employees Healthcare Privacy. Uh, currently, prospective county employees are asked a slew of health-related questions that have questionable pertinence uh, to, to most, really, of the county's job requirements. Uh, they are often asked to submit health uh, information before being offered a job. Any health questions required of applicants should be strictly uh, restricted to an applicant's ability to meet published minimum job uh, qualifications. Additionally, in the current political climate especially, um, any questions related to an applicant's reproductive health information, such as information related to abortion care, miscarriage, contraception, pregnancy, family planning, et cetera, should most certainly be banished from the county application process. Um, and and it, as we just listened to the testimony before me, um, spoke more in depth, um, there's potential violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the county's current application um, may be really in contravention of the law. Under the ADA, an employer may not ask a job applicant, for example, if he or she has a disability or about the nature of an obvious disability. An employer may, may not ask a job applicant to answer medical questions or take a medical exam before making a job offer. 
Um, the county's process seems to dance just on the edge of legality in, in the way that it frames its uh, pre-employment medical questionnaire requirement. Um, you know, certainly there are, we are aware that there are some jobs in the county that nece necessitate the disclosure of some health information. Uh, but not all the jobs require the invasive and extensive questions on the county's form. Um, and this bill gives that flexibility where it is needed. Um, so we urge support of Council Bill 523. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. And this public hearing is now closed. Next item on the agenda is public hearing on the 2023 to 2029 Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service Master Plan. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and this public hearing is now closed. I'll need a motion. I move that we pass this, please. Uh, moved by uh, Chair of the government, uh, Chair of the Public Safety Committee, uh, Councilmember Katz, seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor, I need a hand vote. And that is unanimous. Thank you. And now we are up to the final round of interviews for the planning board. And I see that the four applicants are not all yet in this room, so we will take a recess until 2:15.
Okay. Welcome back. We have our four planning board candidates before us. So, uh, no, I think we're still live. We are still live. Um, so thank you for everybody who is following us during recess and the monotony that goes on here at the County Council. So um, thank you to the four of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, to, to remind everybody, uh, this is the third of three panels for candidates who are interested in serving on the planning board. Uh, the first panel, we had two Republican candidates for that one Republican seat. Uh, last week, we had four unaffiliated individuals for the one unaffiliated seat. And today, we have four candidates for the Democratic seat. And we also had Mr. Brian O'Looney, who joined us last week because he was unavailable today, totaling five Democrats for the one Democrat seat. And so I appreciate Mr. Raj Bar Kumar for joining us, Ms. Cherie Branson, uh, Mr. James Hendrick, and Mr. Alexander Ratner. Thank you all for your interest in serving on the planning board or continuing to serve on the planning board and for all of your uh, activities in the community. And we'll dive a little deeper into those activities and to your vision for Montgomery County. I have a few set questions I will ask uh, before opening it up to my colleagues. And so first question I have, and we'll start with Mr. Barkumar. Uh, Bar what skills and experience do you have that is relevant to the work of the planning board? And can you elaborate specifically with respect to the board's role in the approval of development applications, the drafting of master plans, and the proposed update to the growth and infrastructure policy? And if you turn on your mic right by the microphone, uh, the button, yeah, there you go. Happy Valentine's Day. Same to you. Great timing, guys. I thought you were saving something at the end of this, right? Uh, I have uh, approval plans indirectly because in terms of uh, and of the development design awards programs and for five years and it involved re reviewing approved plans visiting the sites and evaluating the built product of what had been approved. And that was a very enlightening way of understanding the entire process and how it comes together and picking out the best of them. Also, I served as a juror for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Design Development Awards. Uh, and again, the same process. You look at what was submitted, evaluate it, and then vote to get the best of the crop. Same thing again with the U.S. Green Building Council, USGBC. Uh, served on that for three years and as again picking the best projects that was nationwide for the uh, criteria that they had in mind. Review the plans, look at the submission and do that. Now in terms of practically evaluating something. My 30 years experience as a professor of architecture and planning, guiding thesis students to maximize their review, through review, to maximize the potential of their scheme, uh, I think gives me the kind of oversight on what is needed to understand and look at the appeals process and the applications and approve it. In terms of drafting of master plans, I was the uh, designer of the three major ones I'll just tell you. I designed the master plan for a new development in Rogers, Arkansas with Celix and Associates. I also worked on Newtown Macau with John Prescott Architect Planner. And Macau is in China, as you know. That was back when it was still under the British. Uh, Macau was always under the Portuguese, but it was where we des designed a new town. Uh, I designed, I was a design architect and planner for a development, an eco-development 
in Panama on, a to on the top of a hill about a mile out, about an hour outside Panama City, Panama. And that received a commendation from the ambassador, Javier Arias, who was at that time Minister of the Environment and also head of their National Environmental Authority of Panama. And this is what he said, interested in, impressed with the submission that set a new high standard for sustainable development in Panama, I invited him to speak to our senior directors and officers to encourage future projects to follow similar sensitive approaches and techniques. And I have the letter available uh, to the secretary to, uh, to the all for your review. Because when you quote these things, you can't just make it up out of thin air, you know. You have to provide the proof. In terms of updates on growth and infrastructure, I think that my education, which is straddles all kinds of things. It's my first degree was in architecture, but it was called a degree in Bachelor of Science in Built Environment, which covered more than the building, more than the neighborhood. And then I went to the University of London and got a graduate degree from the University of London, which said, which had as its minor development uh, planning, which was enough interest to me, being from a third world country, I wanted to see how you could develop a country like that. And I, and the third was, uh, then I got picked and sent to the University of Kansas and got a Master of Architecture in Urban Design. What a great place to study urban design. I remember being invited to a review at the Kansas State University and driving out and it was farmland. So that was a good way to understand from a remote distance how town and planning came about, town and country planning, and Edward, uh, regardless of all this sort of tidbits. I have straddled that, and then when I finished my term as National President of the American Institute of Architects, it was earlier than most people do, and I decided I would go and do something that was a thought of great significance at that time, it was fairly unknown, and I signed up and got a doctorate in sustainable design. So, and I have three books to my credit based on that. I see that this is the event that needs to be pushed. Uh, it affects everything we do. So, I, I like the way the change of name of, from, uh, what was it called? I need to get this exactly because You know what it was? It was subdivisions. It was a subdivision policy. This one, this renaming is so perfect. It doesn't talk about subdivision. It talks about growth for the county and its people, as well as the infrastructure that is carried and affected by it. So I am quite prepared to put my passion of that direction. I believe that the growth and there was discussion about in that uh, report that I read about from the planning department presenting to you that the percentage of concentration of poverty or low income concentration was 8% and six per only 6% 6 got displaced. Now, I think neither figure is acceptable. Uh, we are making some inroads by doing the uh, requirement for new buildings to incorporate affordable housing. But that's a very slow avenue. And I will get to that uh, later. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Uh, Ms. Branson. Good afternoon to you all. Um, OK, so currently, I am an interim member on the planning board, and so I've had a role to play in a number of uh, site plans, master plans, sector plans. Um, those experiences are important for this role, but what's also important is, you know, my my other life experiences, right? Um, so. You know, as, as you all may or may not know, 
Um, I've lived in a number of places in this county. I um, have lived in uh, apartments that are what we now call naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, in um, near downtown Silver Spring, actually right off of Sligo Creek Park. I've lived in um, a house uh, that is uh, between Long Branch and Indian Spring, uh, which is a totally different kind of neighborhood. And now I live in an area that is considered semi-rural, um, so uh, which is really somewhere between classic suburban and not. <laughs> um, there are literally farms on my street. Um, so, so I say all that to say that you know those those experiences have really taught me a lot about you know about um, this county's vast kinds of considerations when it comes to the quality of life and how people live and and the different choices people want to make I think that all plays a role in planning you know the other things that are in my background that are important of course is you know you you all know I um, served on this council for a little bit and so I got to really understand um, the kinds of policy decisions that that drive planning decisions you know those things matter um, fulfilling the vision you know the planning board's role quite frankly is fulfilling the vision that are set forth in the plans you know the plans are not only crafted and created by the planning board but they're approved by the county council um, we are m more closely your arm than anything else. Um, the um, other thing that other things that I've done that are also important, um, you know, I served as procurement director. And that probably has um, a real corollary that may not be obvious. As procurement director, we had to we had a committee we called the contract review committee. And what would happen is that, you know, people who wanted to make um, um, alterations, amendments to contracts had to come before the committee and plead their case, you know. Um, and those were, you know, people in other departments, right? Uh, and, you know, that has a real corollary to the planning process because that's essentially what applicants before the the planning board are doing. They're coming, they're pleading their case, they're explaining how and why they would like certain things to be certain ways. Our role is to question them and to make sure that um, whatever staff recommends is in line with what these folks want to do. And our role is to question staff about their assumptions, um, their the their policy um, understanding that you know that that has um, and you know those are skills that um, that I practice here on this council as well as you know being a staffer on on Capitol Hill for twenty some years, um, which brings me to the oversight part of my life. Um, and you all, um, I, I think it, the um, the oversight part is really important when it comes to what this board does. You know, um, this board's role is not to rubber stamp. This board's role is to really ask questions and make sure that the quality of life in this county um, is maintained. That's that's what planning is about. You know, and, and, you know, oversight is not, you know, playing gotcha with folks. It's actually setting down and making sure that the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed. Excuse me. <clears throat> those, you know, those life experiences um, have, um, oh, and then there's the other thing, which is, uh, which is just as important, and, and that is um, being able to do the kind of outreach and community engagement that is absolutely necessary. You know, a lot of the 
concerns that people have about the planning process or particular uh, policies or plans have a whole lot to do with how those things have been presented and whether people have had an adequate opportunity to really engage with that process. Um, and then the, the final part of your question, I think, is about the growth and infrastructure plan. The, um, as, as, as Mr. Barkumar um, noted, the growth, growth and infrastructure plan used to be called the subdivision staging plan. Okay, or staging policy, excuse me. The, um, that's a huge change. That, that is not in name only. Because what that does is recognize that we will not, in this county, likely be building a lot of things that are on virgin territory. You know, it's not about subdivision anymore. It's about growth and infrastructure, and that implies that it is really about infill building. Um, and how we do infill building has a whole lot to do with the quality of life. The growth and infrastructure policy is supposed to be updated every four years, so that means in 2024 there will be a new update. That update needs to um, take into consideration many of the things that the people in the community have raised concerns about. Equity is one. Um, displacement, the concentration of poverty, all those things, as well as school um, utilization and how those numbers uh, get to be those numbers and what impact they have. And it's also about the other kinds of infrastructure that have to do with the quality of life in this county parks, transportation, the roads, how the roads are used, um, all those things have a big role to play in, in, in how this all works together. So I think, I think I've probably spent enough of your time. Thank you very much. We've got plenty more questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Branson. Mr. Hedrick. All right. Thank you. And as uh as Mr. Barkumar said, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I've got an a eight-year-old's uh, party to get to after this, so we'll go through this quick. Um, for the skills and experience part, I think the, the biggest part of my background, and, and uh, I know many of you are familiar with it, is in affordable housing and as an affordable housing developer. I currently chair Rockville Housing Enterprises, it's the PHA, uh, for the city of Rockville. Um, talking about experience and skills with master plans and development and site plans and all that kind of thing. We have some experience doing that quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Um, I think that given the housing affordability crisis that we're currently going through right now, the increase in co housing costs, the increase in rents, I think a skilled background in affordable housing is important. Uh, in my previous job at HUD and as a consultant, I've literally traveled from Alaska all the way to Puerto Rico and back. Uh, working with cities and communities, developing master plans, developing site plans, sector plans, uh, pretty much all across the country to help them sort of build up their community, their economic development and their housing. I've done that across the country. And then um, also for growth and infrastructure policy, I've written a lot of policies. I'm a federal employee. I work in regulatory policy. It's literally the name of my office. I do quite a bit of that. Um, for transportation and infra or growth and in infrastructure specifically, I spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of my free time advocating for uh, the development of infrastructure and housing across the county and in Rockville. I think I have a fair amount of experience and background in doing those things, but I think the biggest, probably the biggest takeaway is that as an affordable housing developer and as an expert in affordable housing, that's something we desperately need right now in the county and desperately need, I think, on the Planning Commission. Thank you. Mr. Ratner. Yeah, uh, hit the button just below the microphone. There right. you go. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Council President Glass and members of the County Council. Um, it's an honor to appear before you today. I am a licensed attorney in the state of Maryland with experience working for government agencies at the state and federal level. And as a federal energy efficiency advocate, I'm well versed in sustainability policy and measures in the buildings, transportation, industrial, and utility sectors. I have a developed understanding of building codes, building energy performance standards, LEED certification, and frequently work alongside staff of the U.S. Green Buildings Council 
and the International Code Council. I am an advocate for transportation system efficiency that looks to improve access to public transportation, as well as <coughs> system efficiency, I'm sorry, uh, as well as to create safe and effective pathways for biking and walking so that the United States can rapidly and equitably decarbonize the transportation sector. In a volunteer capacity, I served for several years on the Montgomery County Grants Advisory Group, where I worked as part of a team to review and approve applications for funding from community-based organizations <coughs> uh, to provide services to county citizens in need uh, who were not, you know, whose needs were not well met by existing programs um, from the county. Uh, these applications um, often dealt with services which, which I had no personal experience or understanding, and serving as part of the advisory group inspired me to learn um, about the diverse needs of county residents quickly and compassionately. As part of this work, I had to center equity in my review of applications, um, taking into full consideration the disparate impacts of a history of systemic racism, sexism, and ableism uh, that leaves many of our neighbors with fewer opportunities and resources. As a millennial, I'm part of a still rising generation of workers, residents, and homeowners, um, and parents in the county. Uh, as I reviewed the Thrive 2050 plan and thought about the next 30 years of growth uh, and development, it was not lost in me that in 2050 I will still be of working age. Uh, therefore, I am fully invested in how the general plan turns out. Um, the experience for my generation in this county right now is often one of frustration, frequently frozen out of home ownership, locked into rising rents, uh, and facing some of, if not the steepest, child care costs uh, in the country. Planning is not the silver bullet that can solve all these problems, but smart planning uh, that accounts for lack of housing access, environmental health, racial equity, um, and economic growth can alleviate some of these pressures. Uh, finally, as the father of a three-year-old, uh, I find Montgomery County's vast network of well-maintained parks to be a lifeline to sanity. Uh, my family frequents dozens of parks to encourage healthy play and, frankly, good nap times. Um, and I've been from the South Germantown Recreational Park to Lake Needwood to Wheaton Regional Park, um, and uh, to Glen Echo Park, and we held my son's birthday at the Tilden Woods Local Park. So when the planning board considers the value of parks in this county, believe me, I'm right there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, next question will begin with you, Ms. Branson. What are the most critical issues you believe the board needs to address over the next two years? Well, um, I think there are a few. The, the first is, um, and these are not necessarily in any order of, you know, importance because I think they're all kind of bunched together. Um, the the first I would mention is the um, appointment of an executive director. You know, right now we have an acting executive director, um, and the planning board really needs to start the process of, you know, looking for someone uh, to be a permanent executive director. That's probably not going to be that easy. Um, you know, this is a high-level position in a very popular place, so that's going to be a thing. Um, the the second um, issue, I think, is um, how <laughs> uh, the Development Review Committee and, and, and what that will mean and how the state legislature's plans and work group affect this uh, affect the planning board. I think that's going to be a, an issue. But those are sort of like inside ball things, right? Um, the outside ball things are just as important. Um, those things have to do with the implementation of Thrive 2050 and what that means, the, the restructuring of the, or whatever you want to call it, of the growth and infrastructure plan. Um, and it also has to do with how we do outreach, how we assure transparency, how we restore the trust in this board. That becomes really important. 
um, those things I think sort of go hand in hand um, and, and I think it has a lot to do I think they could be helped by um, um, doing a um, what I keep calling planning 101 you know a sort of series of case studies on the planning board's website that explain walk people through and explain exactly how the process works. I think a lot of the problems with the planning board is a lack of understanding. You know, people don't really um, embrace the process because they don't really know the process. Um, and, and I think it's absolutely incumbent that if you live in this county, you should at least have access to understanding the process. If we don't have understanding, we will never get to transparency. People will not trust institutions that they do not understand. Um, so those are, um, th those are, I think, the major issues. Thank you. Mr. Hedrick. Um, I have many of the same, um, I think, priorities as, as uh, Sharon mentioned. Uh, first, Implementing the Thrive 2050 general plan, uh, I think that's going to be the biggest thing coming over the next couple of years probably for the Planning Commission. Lots of precedents are going to be set. I think it's important that we do a good job there. I think that's probably the most important thing. I'll second hiring a, uh, a permanent executive director. I have experience, as I, as I mentioned, I chair the Public Housing Authority for the City of Rockville. We've almost doubled the number of housing units that we have in our portfolio. A lot of that has to do with having an executive director that can do that job, and that is a incredibly, incredibly important piece of what it is. I think that if there's anything more critical than Thrive, it's going to be hiring the right executive director. Uh, the third thing, and this is both uh, uh, sort of a personal and a policy thing, uh, the pedestrian master plan will be up in a couple of weeks. I biked over here and walked. Um, it could be easier to get around uh, without a car. And I think that one of the other things that we're going to have is really giving, not only with the pedestrian master plan, but with a lot of work that the Planning Commission does is giving people options to get around that are not car-based. Safe options to get around that are not car-based. I take my kids around a lot in the county. I have a little trailer on the back of my uh, bicycle. I put them in their helmets and then I avoid a lot of roads and it limits the places we can go. So I think as we move on over the next couple of years with the Planning Commission or the Planning Board, one of the things that it's going to really have to work on is making sure that there are better options for folks without cars and make sure, sure that's included in all the plans. Thank you. Mr. Ratner. Uh, your microphone. Yep. There Thank you go. Thank you, Council President Class. Um, sure. I uh, second what both Ms. Branson and Mr. Hedrick have said uh, about finding a new director uh, for the planning board that is going to be of key importance. If you could speak up just a little bit. Sure. More, um, I, I second what Ms. Branson and Mr. Hedrick said about finding a planning director. I think that's going to be of key importance. Uh, when it comes to Thrive, I sort of think about two of the issues in there that stand out to me, um, among other things. And of course, uh, the first of those, as I, as I noted before, is housing affordability. Um, we are well behind uh, you know, the number of new dwelling units that are expected for the level of growth that the county has right now, um, and uh, housing prices have significantly outpaced affordability. Um, you know, I think that the planning board is going to have to find creative and innovative solutions to solving that issue and building new dwellings. Um, you know, I think it's going to involve some level of increased density, some level of, uh, you know, rethinking about requirements like parking requirements for apartment buildings. Um, but I just, I just think to, to be on track for the level of growth that we need for Thrive 2050, um, housing affordability is, is a key issue. And then, of course, the other one that stands out to me from my experience as an environmental and clean energy advocate is environmental protection. Um, to some extent, there's some tension with that goal and with creating uh, more housing units or more of any kind of development. Obviously, to a certain extent, the most environmentally friendly thing that you can do is to not build, but that doesn't meet the needs of our human environment. So we're going to have to think as we build and as we expand, what measures are we taking to make sure that we're not harming the environment of our county or closing off our green spaces? Um, 
the organization that I work for, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, uh, publishes a clean energy city scorecard and also a clean energy state scorecard. Unfortunately, there's not a county scorecard, but many of the um, many of the measures that cities can take, um, you know, reducing uh, heat islands, um, providing more access uh, to renewable and distributed energy resources when buildings are built, uh, using more sustainable materials, using smart surfaces, making sure that buildings have more access to uh, to walkability, to the kind of services that county residents need. I think those are going to be key. Um, and then braided through all of that is an understanding of sort of the historical, systemic, racial, and other inequities that many of the systems that our county relies upon are, are built on. And as we solve those other challenges, we have to think about how to address those shortcomings and how to do so in a way that, um, you know, is defensible under the uh, Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment, so that they don't get challenged and brought down in court and that the good that they do is actually implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bar Kumar. Yes. Your microphone. It, hit the button. There you go. Perfect. You might have wrong to hear what I was going to say. That's <laughs> uh, the my vision of being a world traveler and a forty-year resident of Montgomery County is something that has a perspective. I hope that will help. Which is in the richest country in the world. A few miles from the White House and the center of power, we have people living in abject poverty. And we are trying to alleviate that by the process of afford con getting affordable housing in, uh, to the process so that we'll have a more diverse community. As I said in my previous version, my understanding of the planning board is not just only to review subdivisions for housing or transportation models. I have two that I think are very possible. If we expand the thing beyond housing to say we are in charge of land and prosperity and enrichment of the people living here, one thing we could do as the county council and the planning board is incentivize actions that we know need to be taken. For example, Fairfax County has a whole lot of IT offices and jobs is something we can attract here. A rising tide lifts all boats and we need to have social and economic growth and equity that affects, that covers every aspect of every person living in this county. I think that is something that the planning board can easily do within its ambit, is designate areas that are office parks, set the, set the table so that people higher up the chain can invite companies in to do that. The second part is I've noticed and uh, that education is the great equalizer. If you are in a poor concentrated area of uh, low income housing, the chances are pretty good that your school's not getting funded either. So education, regardless of where you are, should be equal, especially public housing, especially because housing is tied to schools and I know that there are some good moves like removing the moratorium and stuff like that. But what you've done with that growth and infrastructure uh, policy and the new actions within it are very, very commendable. I'm just expanding it to include job growth in the county. Because if there are job growth, and then of course we have to make sure that our kids who are coming through the school system are educated sufficiently that they can fill those jobs. So it's not an immediate two-year term proposition, but it is a long-term vision that can help. The second part of that is 
our public transportation is a little abysmal at this point. Much better than Kansas. When I landed in Lawrence, there were no buses. There was no, and uh, there was no public transportation. I literally walked, but having lived in London, I was expecting public transportation. So we have a good system, but for example, the hubs that are the metro hubs, there is not a quick way to get there from most parts of uh, public transportation. The ride-on bus helps, but doesn't serve everyone. So even if I want to not, even if I want to not drive the car into DC, but want instead to take, I need a bus to get to the metro stop. Uh, and so to encourage that, and once it's the transportation piece of the infrastructure, besides lane changing, uh, changing the use of lanes and dedicating it to bus lanes and stuff like that, what about electric buses? Technology exists. It's something that we can, as the planning board, promote and incentivize through the council and up through the state level. So my two versions would be grow the economy. It will lift everyone and give a distribution and give them an opportunity to get educated. I've, put, I've done this not as a theoretical exercise. I have committed to, I joined you, the University of District of Columbia because it had an architecture program that had been struggling to get accredited for 30 years. And it served the local residents mostly on in Ward 8. By getting the place accredited, which I did, by putting my face and name to it and that's a lot of action behind it, we have now made it possible for anyone from that resident in the DC area. And the same thing can apply to Montgomery County, to these concentrations of power, uh, poverty that we're talking about. So action is what is needed, and we are just the planning board that does that, gives it to the council, who can kick it upstairs. But it, the thoughts have to begin there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the third question I have for you this afternoon, and we'll start with Mr. Hedrick. Uh, do you have any limits on your availability to publicly uh, to fully participate in and prepare for board meetings? No, no, no limits on being able to fully participate. Um, I've gotten very used to reviewing materials with a hurricane of children in my house, and I can continue to do so. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Radner. Uh, thank you, Council President Glass. Uh, yeah, I have uh, much the uh, same situation. Uh, I mean, with one child, but a three-year-old, sort of a self-contained hurricane. Um, obviously, if he gets sick from daycare and I have to take care of him in a family with two working parents, that is what it is. Um, you know, I do work full-time as well, but I think that my organization understands the value of what the planning board does and would work to accommodate that with me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bar Kumar. You didn't turn your microphone, but I heard oh, you say oh. none whatsoever. None there, whatsoever. There you go. Uh, I am all in favor of work. Keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Ms. Branson. Uh, yeah, I don't have any um, limitations on my availability. I um, have been doing this for a few months now, um, and it requires, um, you know, a few hours uh, before the meeting and then, well, like a day or so, a couple of days before the meeting, you know, you, um, and then all day on a Thursday, um, usually. So, you know, luckily I'm retired, and so I have I have a little time on my hands. Thank you. Uh, last question from me, and we'll start with Mr. Ratner. Are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Uh, Council President Glass, no, there are no conflicts of interest. Thank, Thank you. No. Thank you. Ms. Branson? No. Likewise, no. I've already checked with the ethics uh, lawyers at my agency, and they're always happy to see me. So. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, I'm now going to open it up to colleagues' questions and comments, and we'll start with Vice President Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to each of you for your willingness, interest, in serving for the service you've already uh, put in. Uh, we really uh, appreciate it. It's another example of these 
uh, interviews, doing all three at once has really shown us the breadth of talent that we have and of interest in public service and how lucky we are in Montgomery County. So I really uh, appreciate that. Um, asking the same question as we all are of uh, prior uh, conversations, um, my question is really about climate change and the work of the planning board. Uh, discussions surrounding our efforts to combat climate change often overlook how important our growth patterns are and how they impact our environment. Yet the planning work uh, at the Planning Commission plays a critical role. The way we grow has an enormous impact on our quality of life, but more importantly, the sustainability of our county and the region as a whole. Could you please discuss how you would view the intersectionality between land use planning policies and the environmental imperative that we have to build sustainable communities in Montgomery County? And you already started talking about this, uh, Mr. Ratner, so perhaps we'll start with you. Thank you, Vice President Friedson. Um, you know, one of the things that I that I often think about in my day job at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy is how do we build systems that address the environmental challenges um, of of climate change and you know also the other impacts of pollution that are often attendant to it. Um, I think that we could do a better job with our plans in sort of centering sustainability efforts. Um, you know, as I read through the growth and infrastructure plan, I was somewhat surprised, and maybe it's because it's not a document that's designed to do this, but I, I didn't see many mentions of sustainability or environmental impact. I don't feel like it was particularly well measured in that plan. So I think I'd perhaps like to see more of that focus in the next plan, and that's, I know, something that the planning board and the council um, will be working on during this term. Uh, you know, I think there are efforts like building energy performance standards, um, access to distributed energy resources that could make a big difference in these terms. I think focus on, um, you know, access to transportation and affordable transportation uh, to get, you know, to get vehicles off the road, particularly while we're still relying on um, a large amount of internal combustion engine vehicles, and uh, then even afterwards, the fewer um, electric vehicles, you know, single-use electric vehicles that um, you're plugging into the grid, the fewer things have to be, uh, you know, replaced with renewable energy resources. Um, so, you know, I think that finding ways to facilitate those things to facilitate vehicle charging access uh, in the plan would go a long way to doing that. Thank you. Yeah, let's just, just go down the line, so Mr. Andrew. All right, go down the line there. All right, um, I, th I think it's, I, I think land use policy is environmental policy. I don't say that there's any way to separate them. I don't think that they are separate. If you're going to have, uh, if you're going to combat climate change at the local level, in the county or a city, you have to address your land use issues. The best thing that you can do uh, for environmental policy and for sustainability is uh, minimize the amount of far-flung greenfield development that you have and give people options that aren't cars. And the best way to do that is to incentivize infill development, um, you know, uh, better land use, more efficient land use there. Uh, improve public transportation, give people the infrastructure they need not to take their car someplace. And that's the, probably the best thing that we can do. So I don't think that there's so much an intersection as a uh, Venn diagram that is a circle between land use policy and environmental policy. So if you, like I said, if you're going to combat climate change at the local level, you've got to address land use. And to do that, you have to make it more efficient for people not to use their cars. And you have to do better land use policy and infill development, minimize the amount of greenfill. If people don't have a place to live closer in uh, or in Montgomery County, they're certainly not moving closer to their job. They're moving further out, they're driving their car more. And that's pretty much a simple thing. So they're absolutely overlapping. Thank you, Ms. Branson. Hi, yeah, um, I do agree that um, that we need to provide incentives for people to step up and, and do these things. The, you know, the planning board not only uh, approves applications for residences, but they also approve applications for, you know, sh uh, 
shopping centers, you know, um, it, it almost got to be a joke. Um, every time we would have a uh, little shopping mall or a strip mall, whatever you want to call them, come before us, I would say, where are the charging stations? There are no charging stations on, on, this, on this diagram. Um, and so we would insert conditions to have charging stations. Um, but that's a very small thing. The, the big picture becomes, you know, whether or not we provide incentives and we, re we require in some way or another, and we do to some extent, um, uh, we, um, we look at um, impervious surfaces, you know, how, how the water runs off the concrete or not does have a, an incredible environmental impact, you know. Um, we, we look at um, rooftop green areas, you know, that plays an environmental role. We look at, um, you know, transportation hubs, and, and we have to start looking at electrification in some of these plants. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, little things that can make a big impact. Yes, it's, it'll be wonderful if we can do something about transportation and the transportation hubs, but I think we need to be realistic in that Montgomery County was developed in a way where we have a lot of areas that are intended to not be uh, accessible to public transportation. Um, there, you know, a lot of our subdivisions do not have, um, you know, direct access to, to public transportation. We're not going to change that overnight. But what we can do, what we have to do in order to assure that, you know, we have um, responded to the need to, um, uh, responded to climate change is, is that we can require going forward and really, well, we can require going forward building designs that allow for the maximum environmental impact in a positive way. We can incentivize that. We can, um, and, and that's kind of up to you all how much of an incentive we give for that. But that's, that's highly possible. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It goes to my heart. As someone who has designed buildings and developments that are net zero energy consuming, net zero water consumption, and net zero carbon emission. I would second everything that I've heard, plus also to it add incentives to drive electric cars used to happen and then got phased out. Uh, electric cars, by the way, when we tap into the PEPCO system, we don't really necessarily know that it's not fired by coal, uh, that it's not produced by anything other than clean energy. So there is a decentralizing aspect to this that I have always pursued and advocated. That is, there's plenty of sun where we are in this county we can easily get our own power right off the roof. Or at worst, at, the, at least, sign up for clean energy sources to feed into Pepco. So driving an electric car or electric bus, riding one, is incidental to knowing where it comes from. Why do we not collect the rainwater? like I'm doing on a project in Canem, in uh, south of Cancun, in Playa del Carmen, and reuse that to irrigate and flush toilets. You don't have to go into any great technology for that. So these kinds of actions, the way we can get more people to buy into this, which will reduce the impact on climate and reduce the impact on energy and help the infrastructure and so forth, Policy is one thing. Turning it into action on every ground is the, is the real answer. And that's what I would advocate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President.
Thank you. Next up, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you very much for coming forward and your willingness to serve. Been very impressed with your answers and even more impressed with your background. So thank you all very much. And I concur with the parks being a lifeline for young parents. Uh, I've been there, done that, and I'm living that right now. So I know what you mean. Um, so uh, same question, uh, several of you brought up one of the pressing issues that this next body will have to enact is appointing a new planning director. If you could ex expand a little bit on what you'll be looking for uh, in a planning director, that would be helpful. And Ms. Branson, why don't we start with you? Um, I think the new planning director has to not only have the kinds of skills and experiences that we see in our, our current acting director, um, but also hopefully would, would have an understanding of this community. You know, Montgomery County is, um, is a very special place in a lot of different ways. You know, um, we are known for our parks and our schools. This is the quality of life that people come here looking for. I think a planning director really has to embrace those, those notions of, of who we are as a county. Um, it can't be, um, we, well, there are, I guess what you call soft skills that would be very necessary in, in a planning director. Um, we have, um, because we do have a, um, a, a, I want to say impression that a lot of people have um, that the planning board is, is distant and doesn't care about the quality of life that is kind of the, you know, the developer's handmaiden. Um, we, we need a planning director who is going to be strong enough to allow people to see that the, the role um, sh he or she plays is in guiding the staff to make sure that the um, goals and policies of this council are taken seriously are implemented um, stringently um, because this all impacts the quality of life that um, that every resident of this county enjoys. Thank you. Why don't we go this way, Mr. Hendrick? Um, just a second, pretty much everything that, that uh, Ms. Branson said, but um, I've been through this process now a couple of times, hiring an executive director with Rockville Housing Enterprises, or at least rehiring and giving a new contract to the same executive director. Um, it's incredibly important, and as I mentioned earlier, we've got about twice as many housing units as we used to. A lot of that comes down to the leadership with our executive director, in addition to skills and experience and knowledge and all the things that you would normally want. Uh, I would really be looking with someone for someone that has the ability to build a team uh, and to hire and develop the staff below them. I think that is a key factor from what we've seen over at uh, RAG for our ability to go out and do more than we used to. We have our basic administrative things taken care of. We have people handling the programs that we get federal money for, all that kind of thing. Having a good executive director to develop those people, put them in the right positions, make sure that they can take care of that, gives the board and the executive staff the ability to have to do more outside. And I think so if I'm looking for anything apart from the normal things you would think of, skills, experience, background, all that, it's the ability to develop that team, ability to develop the staff, and some proven background in doing that and in bringing that to wherever they've been in the past. Thanks. We can do a little audible here. Mr. Barkumar had his hand up, so we'll go to him next and then uh, Mr. Ratner at the end there. Mr. Barkumar. Oh, okay, got it. All right, great. Then Mr. Ratner. I'm um, sure. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Albernos. Um, I, uh, that was kind of my answer. So um, I, I think that being able to hire, retain, and manage a staff is one of the most important things that a leader can have to do. Um, and it really is the difference between a well-run office and one that's not well-run. Uh, when I was a staffer for the House Committee on Energy and Commerce um, in the United States House of Representatives, I worked with the staff of many members of Congress. And what I found was that what separated the effective congressional offices from 
the less effective ones was less the individual knowledge and talent and vision of the member as it was how well they were able to attract talented staff and get the most out of them. Um, I saw that repeated time and time and time again. The, the very best ones were both knowledgeable and intuitive and innovative and could hire a good staff, but the, the staff question was um, you know, very clearly at the top of the list for me, and it will be here too. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, Mr. Barkumar. Your microphone, sir. There you go. What you're really looking for is a leader who can inspire loyalty, hard work, and set the direction for how to interpret what the county wants and needs. They can be from anywhere. I don't think a person with that kind of skill will also have empathy. Empathy for the new setting, a uh, sense of purpose, and I think, as I said previously, one of the main things that we need to do is to make it possible, as it says in the vision and in the mission statement, for the state of Maryland as well as the county, that we encourage the growth and thriving lifestyle for all our people. And that's the part we're falling short on, the all of our people part. And that requires empathy and self-confidence to be able to go down into the ditches to work. So a leader who's prepared to kick the mud and pick up the rocks is what you need. Thank you. Appreciate that. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Next, Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Thank you for being here, um, and thank you for your service to the community. Um, so we are a richly diverse community, and not only racially and culturally, but also geographically. Can you talk about your understanding and vision for the different planning and transportation needs for urban, suburban, and our rural communities? Thank you. I've lost track. <laughs> so where are we starting? Are we starting with? Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Council Member Balcom. Um, you know, I think one of the things when you consider the difference between urban, suburban, and rural planning is that in order to meet the many challenges that we're looking at in the 21st century that are laid out in Thrive 2050, you do have to have some sense that you have to be site specific, that there are things that are appropriate um, for an area of urban density um, that would not be for one of more suburban or more rural density. Um, you know, as I noted before, I think that building up affordable housing units is very important, and, and I think to to some extent, doing that is um, is going to blur some of of those lines that have traditionally been there. But I don't think that you can just you know take and, and bulldoze through things. I mean, you need to consider the importance of you know brown fields versus green fields when uh, you're conducting development. You have to consider um, the kind of transportation access that's in the community, how quickly you can reasonably develop um, better access, uh, and, and how you can maintain sort of the character of an existing community. You know, people, um, when you, you buy a home, you have a certain expectation of what the character of that community is. You, you know, even when you're renting a place, you're doing that because you sort of have a sense of where you are. I think some of that does need to be preserved, um, you know. So, I, I think that looking at development applications across those kind of areas, you'd really have to be site specific, and I would plan to be. Thank you. All right. Um, I mean, it's. I think it's obvious that that, that every part of the the county, uh, urban, suburban, or rural, deserves sort of the same attention and respect from the from the planning commission. And I think if you look through the, the planning documents, particularly the, the general plan Thrive, you know, you hear a lot about 15-minute communities, which is a, a super fun buzzword uh, that I really enjoy. Um, I don't really enjoy it. But 
it really and and we talk about and then so people read that and they see that so what does that mean to me i live in damascus or what have you um you know when when you look at the principles that are behind that a lot of it has to do with going back to a type of development that we had before before we had car centric before we had interstates and things like that you can't make every community in the county a 15 minute community but there's a lot of aspects of things like thrive and the development principles that we have that apply pretty much everywhere trails and sidewalks are good if you live in damascus and or if you live in uh, rockville um, another thing is i one of the reasons i moved to montgomery county was that i have family out in damascus and uh, my in-laws live out there, my kids' grandparents. Uh, we go out to see them a lot. I want them to be able to sort of stay in Montgomery County, be able to go see their grandparents. I'd like for us to develop a way that they can go see their grandparents without driving on 270 when they're old enough, because uh, I've seen them on their bikes, and that terrifies me. Uh, but there are aspects of the development principles behind Thrive that can be applied to all of our communities, all the way from you know the edge with Frederick, all the way down into to Silver Spring, and we can apply those uh, judiciously and where it's appropriate. Uh, but there's aspects of them that I think apply everywhere. Um, you know, as we develop new plans for new places, whether they're rural, urban, or suburban, I think the first thing we have to bear in mind is um, diversity and equity and how those plans will affect diversity and equity in this county. You know, we have, um, you know, we recently the, uh, had a um, exploration of, of um, restrictive development in this county, um, essentially how segregation got mapped out. Um, we are now looking at um, levels of uh, concentration of poverty that are disturbing, um, potential for the um, displacement of, um, of black and brown people, which is disturbing. And so whether we are looking at urban, rural, or suburban, when it comes to new plans, we have to consider all those things too. Of course, you know, Thrive 2050 does provide a really good, um, uh, really good guidelines when it comes to, to what we do with, um, you know, rural development or the, the um, allowing the rural area, you know, the ag reserve to remain the ag reserve, um, there, there really isn't sort of a cookie cutter answer. I think Thrive does allow each um, part of this county to maintain its character. I think that has to be a big part of this. Um, people move to a place because they want to be in that kind of place, whether it's rural, urban, or, or traditionally suburban. Um, as we move forward, we have to have respect for that. Um, but we cannot forget, you know, that there are some others, you know, socioeconomic stuff going on that, um, and. Uh, our demographics are rapidly shifting, have shifted, um, and, and, and we have to be um, cognizant of those things too. So it's not just about, um, about um, drawing up nice plans, it's got to be about the quality of life, about the character of the life, of the lives we're helping people build, you know, and that that's going to change depending on um, um, what's, what's required to make that happen will change depending on um, the, the kind of place we're talking about, whether it's rural, urban, or suburban. As, as, as Mr. Hedrick pointed out, trails and parks are, and, and, and schools that are not over capacity are, are good everywhere. <laughs> Those are basics. Um, and when you get beyond that, you really have to consider the character of the community and what the people who live there um, already are really looking for. Excellent question. What we do to the le for the least among us will affect and uplift the rest of us. And I believe that it, 
you it's a very richly diverse county which is blessed with good educational system but if you look at every parent whether they are homeless and standing with a signboard saying two kids to feed which you have seen and i have seen in this county we are not doing our job as well as we can so i would suggest that my vision would be do for the least of us because those who are above the in the, in the uh, affluent section would be able to look after themselves they need some help too but the i was involved in a bad design of the shelter luther place shelter for the homeless battered women and children in washington dc and it started off as being a focus when i came from florida to figure out why focus when i came from florida to figure out why there were people sleeping under the bridges and over the grates in the height of winter my simple mindedness told me if i had a few dollars i could scratch together i would hop on a bus or somehow find my way to a warmer climate birds go south so the idea that we have unique conditions that we can address that affects people of all diversities to me is the driving en- engine for what we are doing when we talk about bicycle lanes set aside i don't see it as i have seen in third world countries people going to work as their primary mode of transport are the cyclists what we have in our on our cyclist uh, lanes are mostly people doing recreational cycling nothing wrong with that and i think it's a very good way to get out there and get fresh air is better be stands better being in a in an enclosed area so the vision is really let's do for the least of our people whatever color whatever they are wherever they live what they can get out of it and help them out Thank you. Uh, next is Council Member Stewart. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, so some of you touched on this before, but I'd like to ask this question of all of you. Um, as you know, there have been some questions raised about transparency and decision making of the planning board. Uh, whatever your opinions are <laughs> regarding that, I'd like to ask you, if you are selected um, to serve on the planning board, Uh, moving forward, how do you plan to address these concerns, build confidence and trust in the planning board? Um, and I'm not, maybe Ms. Branson, do you want to start? Uh, <laughs> I lost track of how we were doing this. I don't remember either, so that's good. <laughs> Happy Valentine's <laughs> Day to you. Uh, <laughs> um, transparency, building, you know, as I've, I've said, um, and here's the thing. Um, people trust what they understand. People trust what, because to me that's what transparency is. It's really about how do we build trust, how do we build public confidence. You know, um, people trust what they understand. We've, we've come a really long way, I think, in making sure that all of the planning board meetings, with the exception of, you know, when the planning board goes into executive session to talk about personnel and Uh, payroll type things um, the um, but but all, everything else is is streamed you know um, I uh, would love for it to be live just like you know like this is live you know um, planning board meets on Thursday may maybe may maybe this you know that could be a part of it um, but but in addition to the public exposure if you will of the process what I believe would really be helpful is a sort of planning 101 the 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 um, website of the planning board can be used as a teaching tool you know that to me is important because people trust what they understand and right now what you have um, 
what I've seen, and there's nothing unusual. It's not just, you know, relegated to, to this one thing. But whenever you have um, only a few people who truly understand something, then they become the experts. And their community asks them, well, what do you think? You know, um, at that point, everybody else, everybody else's voice really doesn't always get heard. You know, and it's not that people are uninterested, it's that people have whole full lives. And so they're more likely to listen to someone they believe knows, um, even though that person may not actually know. <laughs> you know, so so spreading as much knowledge as possible, giving as many opportunities for public engagement as possible. The planning board um, really needs to get out more um, when we when they do these um, master plans, I know not too long ago in um, uh, Briggs Cheney they had a uh, I think it's called a placemaker. Um, I don't want to call it festival, but it was kind of festive. Um, you know that sort of thing is helpful. It helps to change people's attitudes about uh, about what this stodgy thing is. You know, maybe it's not so stodgy. Maybe it's m way more accessible. Maybe it's stuff you really already know but you hadn't thought about it this way. You know, those those kinds of activities are important. Um, and, and you know, the in my, in my humble opinion, um, I, I think the planning board is is kind of turning uh, the corner to do a lot more of that. I mean, I think they did some of it, um, but but the need for it, um, I think, is appreciated. They now, I think, there is an appreciation that um, that there is more of a necessity. All right, we'll go this way. Um, I think I second everything that that was just said on um, how information. And, and people having knowledge about the process can be incredibly helpful with trust and credibility. I think it's very obvious that the planning board took a took a hit with their credibility and their and their sort of public image. Um, I agree with the, when we uh, when I joined my neighborhood association in Twinbrook over there, we did a lot of work with educating our our neighbors about you know what housing means, what development means. A lot of that usually fell to me as somebody that was involved in, in affordable housing, and it did help. It's not a dangerous thing, it's not a frightening thing, it's more neighbors and neighbors are great. You know, we all like each other, we're gonna like more people that come in here, it's gonna be fun. In addition to the knowledge and information, I think the key, the, the other key aspect is, is the transparency and the engagement. It's an outreach, I think it's an outreach problem as much as it is anything else. Um, a lot of times, particularly boards like the, the planning board, we wait for people to come, come to us, they testify, they go. If you sit there and you wait for people to come to you, what you get is people like me that have an obsessive and problem with housing policy and land use. Uh, and that's not representative of the community. It does not sort of build the trust that you need because you are coming in and saying, here's how it's gonna be. This is what we're going to do. This is our plan. And so in addition to sort of having the information, passing that on, and I do think that the, the planning board's done a good job. The website has some nice stuff. It's, it's got some information there. We can do more with that. You've gotta do the outreach. You've gotta do the engagement. And that is more than just holding an open hearing on a Thursday, it's going out and doing more of the canvassing, uh, you know, more of the door knocking, you know, more of the passing out, here's the information, here's the one page for that kind of thing. So in addition to the information, you've gotta have some of that outreach and engagement to build up that trust. Thank you, Council Member Stewart. Um, I agree with uh, watch much of what the uh, previous candidates uh, had to say about that. I, I definitely think you know that, that in my experience, looking at how do you get information out about government programs, that civic engagement is sort of a, a, a problem of time, capacity, and attention. Um, it's just very hard for people to to be aware of what's going on with all the things that uh, they have to do uh, just in their lives. Um, so I, I definitely think that one of the things that I've found in the work that I do is that going out to the community and being where people are uh, is valuable. You know, some things I would consider are maybe once in a while you don't hold the planning meeting on a Thursday, you do it on a Saturday. 
Um, maybe you do it in a park with a playground in the summer. I don't know. <laughs> um, or, you know, uh, at a community civic association or uh, groceries outside of a grocery store, you know, somewhere where people go in their, in their daily lives so that they can uh, have access to it. I think, you know, especially for, um, you know, people who work a full-time job or, or sometimes more than one uh, full-time job, um, just, yeah, engaging in an open uh, session of the council is, is probably not something that they're going to do. They'll become aware of the planning board's activities only sort of in the most distant way. So I think those are some of the things that I would consider doing. Thank you. Everything's been said. <laughs> the, it's a very good group. And we should all four be put on it. <laughs> and we'll just take one month off each <laughs> in rotation. The idea of transparency is made more important when there's been a crisis. And the way you address a crisis is by going to the people. You sort of, websites are good, good press coverage is good, but TikTok seems to get a whole lot more review. Uh, that was only a joke. The going to events that people come to and explaining what's going on in your neighborhood. The only time anyone complains or talks about the planning board is when it's in my backyard. So going to that local community, to the community center, and we have had congressmen come to our uh, delegates, come to our association meeting, homeowners association meeting, of which I was a president. When they come and talk, they understand what our thoughts are, and they go around. So maybe the planning board, while it meets on mass, can in fact send a designated person to go talk to the community in which this action is taking place. Otherwise, it's just theory out there. It has to be real to you because people's lives are full and they only watch what they want to see. Thank you, Councilmember Stewart. Next, Councilmember Mink. Thank you, Council President. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm so impressed by the breadth of your expertise and your varied backgrounds. This has been a great conversation. Um, thank you all so much for putting yourselves uh, forward for this. Um, I also don't know what order we should go in, so we will. Let's start with Mr. Bar Kumar, and then and then we'll loop around and go and go left um, and and then with uh, Ms. Branson. Um, my question is about outreach and community engagement, and you just you all just said a lot about that. So if you want to keep it short, feel free. Um, if you want to leave into the second part of my question uh, a little more, that's fine. Um, what is uh, the planning board doing uh, doing right right now, and uh, how can the planning board improve in regards to outreach to and co-creation of policy with residents who have not traditionally been engaged in planning decisions? And how should the planning board balance community input with the expertise and judgment of planning board commissioners? Hearing from more people can only help. Two heads are better than one. You could be an expert like crazy, but the local person knows their own situation, and we need to hear from them. How we get that done is the tough part. because. Going to them seems to be easier in communities when there's something happening in that community rather than have only the loudest voices contacting you or speaking at the board meeting hearing. Thank you, Mr. Barkumar. Mr. Ratner? Sure. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Mink. Um, you know, I, I think to the first part of your question, going out and being among the community, especially communities that have not traditionally uh, had an opportunity to participate or, you know, just have, have lacked access to participate and haven't participated because of it in the past, I think is very important. Um, just like uh, Ms. Branson said earlier, um, you know, streaming the sessions, um, I think would be important too. That not everybody necessarily has access to high speed internet, but, you know, for people who time is one of the issues, just being able to turn that on while they're going about their day, uh, you know, could facilitate some more interaction. I think in terms of the balance between 
you know, the knowledge of experts and the input of the community, um, you know, from my own, you know, place of understanding uh, of the planning process, I would, would tilt towards input from the community. I mean, you know, what experts have to say is, is very important. Uh, it needs to sort of be a framework around which you build things, but I, I'm very interested in what, you know, people think about the communities that, that they live in and, and not sort of operating by elite fiat over that. I don't think that's a good way to build trust. It's not a good way to build transparency. It doesn't build policy that, that lasts, and we need the plans that we conduct over the next 30 years um, to last. Thank you. All right. Um, we, we did just talk about outreach. So in outreach, I'll, I'll just say that I think one of the things that I learned from being on the board of the, the Public Housing Authority is that your job as a board member is as ambassador for the organization. That's just part and parcel of your job. You need to go out there and you need to talk to people. And when people have a question or you're in a community or something like that, you're the one that they need to. You need to be available and accessible. So as an ambassador for the community, I think that's the, the sort of the outreach um, sort of the only thing to sort of put on on the outreach question for the the thing about expertise and, and judgment I think that it you you have to develop the policy as, as a collaborative system you have to to like you said co-create the policy otherwise if no one buys in no one's gonna do it and that is part of what you have to go out and do the outreach for is active listening and actual engagement as opposed to just putting yourself in there or waiting. like I said if you wait for people to come to you you get a lot of people that know a whole lot about land use and maybe a lot less about the communities that, that we're talking about. So you you are an ambassador for the organization for you know whatever one you are when you're on a board. Part of your job is to do that. And then part of the job is to balance that, take that policy that's been created, work with it, say that's maybe not the best idea. What if we try something like this? If you guys want something there, I think we can do something because I know of X. You know, it's kind of like when you're when you're talking about transportation policy is something that's kind of related. Nobody wants traffic, but the best way not to get traffic is not to build another highway line. You know, and so that's where the expertise and judgment comes in as another lane on the highway. So you have to spend sort of every part of your decision making is sort of balancing those two aspects. You know, too much one way and you never get the change that you need to develop where you're at, to put something new in, to do something better. And if you don't listen, you're going to do something nobody wants in the first place. So you are an ambassador and part of your job, I think, should be to constantly sort of be engaging in their process. It's not just for the sector plan or just for this individual policy. It's a constant outreach process and that's part of something I think that's, that's part of the job. Um, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I've talked a lot about outreach and how you know outreach should um, should really be a, a a total part of anything the planning board's doing. So I really want to talk more about the other part of your question. Um, but but I would add on the outreach piece that um, that we don't seem to have. Um, I give the planning board credit for translating a lot of things into Spanish. You know that are. Um, but we, but the demographics of this um, of this uh, county also, uh, to me, indicate that you know uh, French and Amharic should should be among the translated uh, languages too, um, and that has to be done consistently. You know, people. Um, well, that's that part. Um, as far as balancing community interests with. Um, with the knowledge of the experts, so to speak. Um, bad paraphrase of your question, but, um, you know, what I know for sure is that everybody's an expert in their own lives. Everybody's an expert in their own lives. And if we do not, you know, what, whoever the public official is, does not hear and respect the things that people are telling you, about their lives um, and and how those things affect the quality of life, then we really haven't done our job job when it comes to public service. You know, the planning board's uh, big function is about um, preserving the quality of life in this county, and so it's not about. Um, 
so it, so so there really shouldn't be a um, division between the community interests and the opinion of the experts. Quality of life means you have to listen to and respect the people who are living right there, right then, and and truly hear what they have to say. There, as I, you know, um, the planning board's function is not to give people what they what they think they want. You know, you also can't give people everything they think they want. There, there has to be a middle ground. You know, and the way you get to any good compromise, the way you get to any middle ground, is to actually be listening to what people are saying. Because if you're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to make the deal. Um, and making the deal is how people embrace what change is about to occur in their life. That's what the planning board, I, personally I think that's why the planning board stokes it, why it engenders so much anger. <laughs> is that people see them as, oh you're about to come here and change my life. Um, you, and, and that, that has to be uh, respected too. That, you know, people fear change. Um, and so that that is why the outreach and the understanding and the listening becomes even more important. Um, you, you you have to give people that opportunity, and it's um, and and the experts. You know, I used to tell people I could explain physics to a three year old because I understand physics. So the experts are kind of um, required to have the level of understanding um, that does not allow, that does not mean they are dumbing something down, but if you truly understand something, you can explain it to people on a whole lot of different levels. And, you know, and that's, that's incumbent upon us, on you, to, to demand that. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, next, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you all for applying and for your answers and your interest. I, candidly, you have answered my question, the, the, especially just now. But during Thrive, part of the concern that the public had, that we heard, that I heard, was that, yes, the planning board met with many, many people, but they had their minds made up before they went there. And all of you have touched on this. You don't have to add anything to it unless you feel like you need to. But in some instances, the uh, and whether it was fair or unfair, that's what people said. And I, I think it becomes extremely necessary that, that, uh, that a person realizes that not only are you uh, there to listen, you're also there to hear from them and not with your minds made up. So I don't know if you want to add anything to what you just said. And Ms. Branson, if you could explain physics to me sometime, I'd love to have that conversation. <laughs> and there again, why don't we start with Ms. Branson, and then if you have anything, if you don't have anything to add, that's fine. perfectly all right. I'm not, I don't want to talk about physics right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'm sorry. So. So yeah, I you know I share your concern about about Thrive 2050. I was part of one of those focus groups, um, and that was long before you know I even considered doing this. Um, the um, what you know I what I really think it's important to understand, and maybe this is what happens if you've been in politics for a minute, is that there's a huge difference between persuading people to your point of view and and listening to what people are saying to you and and maybe changing your point of view it's a huge difference um, I think what I heard um, and continue to hear is the fear about Thrive 2050 is that it will cause displacement um, and that it will not um, it will not actually serve the needs of uh, black and, and brown community that it will actually cause displacement gentrification and the black and brown community will be will be the folks who will suffer that's what I've heard the most okay um, 
it is um, it is it is absolutely critical that um, that those fears are addressed um, according to I think it's called the neighborhood change study that was done um, those fears are not unreasonable you know they're um, it, the the notion that development dis equals displacement um, has actually occurred in this Washington metropolitan area. And so for people to have that fear is not the craziest thing in the world. Um, what I believe needs to happen is that on in every sector plan, on every master plan, you know, that the um, that the the words, the word equity is not tossed around so much as it is um, um, truly expounded upon how this thing gets to equity, you know, how it changes the narrative. Um, if we don't, you know, if, if that's not done, then the fears that people have will continue, they'll grow, and heaven forbid, they'll be realized. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. I, I, I don't have much to add um, to what I previously said, but <clears throat> again, you're, you're an ambassador for the organization. You have to be the one present to be there to say we're, li to, we're listening. Not only we're listening, we're going out to get your input and your engagement. Uh, at the end, decisions have to be made. It's not necessarily your job to persuade, but your job to sort of collate, bring in everything and take that. So I think part of it is that at least for this kind of a board, persuasion is not necessarily as much of your thing. Information is one, but not necessarily the persuasion part, which I think leads to sort of a, a half of a conversation sometimes, which gives people that, that indication. But I think the way that you combat that is sort of, as I said, you're an ambassador and your engagement, your outreach is an ongoing process, not a limited process, not for now, not for then. We'll come talk to you after the sector plan is over. We'll come talk to you when we're doing an implementation. They're putting in a site down the road. We'll come back, you know, we'll come back, we'll send somebody, that kind of thing. So the more that you spend your time as an ambassador and as making yourself accessible, I think that goes a long way to building that sort of trust and saying we're listening to you. We may not always agree, but this is, you know, we're, we're, we're out here, we're engaged, and, and you can uh, yell at us, uh, tell your you know, content, but you have to make yourself accessible. I think that's part of the job. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Um, you know, I, I would agree that accessibility uh, is a major point of this. I think you need to be out in the community early and often, uh, not just sort of when the plan is baked. Um, I would say, you know, that for my part, uh, I have principles, you know, things around the environment, things around affordable housing, things about how we deal with systemic inequalities uh, that are important um, in, in what I would be looking for in a plan. But the details, the specifics of it, uh, my, my mind is not made up, and I would be very interested in what the community has to say about it and to incorporate their suggestions. Thank you. The reality is that they are not making any more land but there's a whole lot more people getting urbanized. And so change is inevitable when it comes to trying to accommodate that group. The idea would be to make the smallest possible footprint, go up higher if you have to, and incorporate those people who are in fear of being displaced into the scheme. Uh, the fears are correct. They are well-founded. How do you make it possible for them to continue to live in the neighborhood that they lived in, even as the neighborhood changes? Because it will change. You need to find ways of incorporating and making up for their deficiency in currency to be able to stay where they are. That might mean subsidies. It might mean work. Whatever it is, it needs sweat equity, whatever it takes, that fear is very realistic. This is not the kind of, well, we've seen in the 1960s urban renewal, just plowing right through entire communities, regardless of what ethnicity they were. 
uh, and out of that came highways and things like that that created more transportation faster. So that's how that's how life works. The fears are only going to be allayed not so much by talking to them or listening to them, but by to positive action to make sure that they are not displaced, that they have a place in that community where they were. It will not look the same as it was when they first moved in. Nothing does. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you to all of you for being here today and uh, applying to the planning board. I don't even know why would you do that, especially being a former member of the planning board. Um, my question is related to the Parks Department. Um, yesterday with the PHP committee, the Planning, Housing and, and Parks Committee, we had the Parks Department in front of us talking about the PROS plan, which is the Parks Recre Recreation and uh, Open uh, Space plan that we have. And I would love to hear from you. Um, what are your ideas or, or vision to make sure that our Parks Department continues to evolve uh, with an economic development sense? because it's an, an extraordinary economic development tool. People want to live near a park, near a trail, near amenities. Um, so any thoughts on that will be awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Um, you know, I, I haven't had a, a chance to look at the parks plan as much myself, but I think when we're um, you know, approving new development plans, finding ways to incorporate some sort of park space, especially in you know more developed areas that may have less access to green space, space to exercise, playgrounds. That um, encouraging uh, building of those facilities uh, would be a positive step. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. I think on the on the park side is. is you know, we've we've talked about a couple of times of kids, and we are heavy users of the parks, both in Rockville and uh, in Montgomery County, more general, more generally. Um, I think if we're on the park side to keep it developing, I think it's uh, I think it would be nice to to get more active use of the parks, more events, more activation. Um, you know, I think we've started to see a little bit of some of the parks in Silver Spring. Acorn Park, I know, has some events and things like that. I think that we've got a bunch of parks around that could have more of those type of events, more activation, that's going to mean more staffing and things like that. But I think if you're looking for sort of a vision for the parks in the future, I think activating more of the parks. They're great green space, they're great passive spaces, but they're also opportunities for people to come together and bring people in. And I think that's that's a big piece of it. I think the other thing is sort of um, capital structures, like more building, not you know housing of the parks, but like restrooms, water fountains, playgrounds. I think there should be probably three to four playgrounds per park, just as a personal thing. I think that would make my kids happy. Um, but more of those capital intensive structures, get those, get the parks, have there th be things for people to use there, and then activate them for more events. I think it's probably the future of the parks is to see more of that. I can certainly understand why, you know, people want to live near parks. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, that, that need for green in our lives is really important. Um, Unfortunately, um, the problem becomes if you build too much near the parks, then 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 you're kind of messing up the thing that you loved. You know, I mean, it's you, you, it has that, you know, there there is that tipping point that occurs. Um, I think the the one of the really important things we can do with the parks um, is is um, to ensure funding for more land acquisition, as Mr. Bar Kumar said, land's one thing they ain't making any more of. You know, so um, so so that you know, the county actually engaging in um, purchases of empty land could be a huge boon to the parks, um, and it could also be a way of offering more activities. I think. Um, yeah, I know the the parks department has a really um, robust summer, you know, activity plan. Um, my son was a part of it a couple summers. I think he actually worked for them at one point. Um, but, but, um, but, I, you know, we we do the the holiday lights. We do, you know, we we make use of the parks 
but I really believe that um, that there needs to be, you know, a, a strategic plan that actually asks that question. You know, how can the parks be used as an economic engine in in without undermining the things that people love about the parks? You know, I I'm sure um, you know better minds than mine could probably you know, get paid a consultant fee and come up with some really groovy stuff for you, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> One way of thinking of a park is that it's the lungs of the city. All the com carbon dioxide that comes around gets converted to oxygen. It is therefore part of the climate change issue. Central Park is a very good example of that. So there must be some funding that's possible to tap into at federal and state level that addresses climate and climate change. And some portion of it can be applied to subsidize the park. So you don't have to have a way of encroaching upon it or turning it into a money-making Disney World minor style. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember oh, Council Sales is not here right now. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to Councilmember Jawando. Happy to filibuster. Um, just wanted to thank you all for applying. Um, and you answered my question, which I'd asked at the, at the, of the previous panels about the growth and, growth and infrastructure policy. So I appreciate the incorporation of that into the questions and, and you're asking. Um, happy Valentine's Day. It's also uh, Frederick Douglass's chosen birthday. Uh, so happy, happy day there as well. Um, I would just underscore a couple of points that were made and no need to respond. Uh, the, the trust and transparency that's required now for the planning board has never been more important. I think you all understand that. I want to associate myself with the comments of Councilmember Katz and others um, that this is a position that needs to be open-minded. Change is hard. Um, and as we take up Thrive and implement it, as we take up the various master plans, whoever is selected, um, I, I feel confident uh, and just want to underscore that having meaningful engagement um, and, and meaningful solutions, to Mr. Varkumar's point, of addressing the concerns of people is going to be of the utmost importance. We all have an ideological and uh, other bents that to us, you know, and you've stated those today as you should. You come as professionals with a policy background, but please remember that um, because change management is, is just as much of this job as anything else um, and uh, appreciate and just wanted to underscore that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Hi. Um, in each of your comments, and I thank you for uh, for your very thoughtful comments to the answers of my colleagues' questions so far. You've you've touched upon upon different um, pieces of this, but I want to ask you very clearly and very directly, since I've asked the other panels who have uh, been interviewed by us. Um, everybody has their own personal preferences and, and biases or predilections, so what would you do or how would you plan to go about setting those aside in your decision making should you be selected to um, retain your position or be offered a position on the planning board? Uh, uh, <laughs> the order. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll go from right to left. How about that? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Lukey. Um, I've been thinking about, I've, you know, had watched some of the previous sessions, and I've been thinking about that question a lot. Uh, I think it just, I, I've heard someone say that they didn't have biases, which I think we all have biases. I certainly have, have biases. Um, I think when you accept a position of tr public trust, whether that's as an elected official, um, you know, an appointed member of a board or a commission, um, a staff member at um, a, you know an agency, uh, you you have to be able to recognize your bias and be able to put it aside as you take input. Um, from the many sort of stakeholders that provide information that's important for you to make decisions. And, you know, I think that that is something that I did as staff for the Committee on Energy and Commerce, um, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform before that, um, you know, 
when you work for a member of Congress, you, you don't always agree with, with them on, on every issue. Um, you still have to execute what they want you to do. As a member of this board, you, you know, have a little bit more autonomy. You're not directly reporting to a specific member, but you are working for and reporting to the community uh, in a real sense. And, and I think that I would approach that in a, in a very similar way. Thank you. Uh, oh, thanks for the question. I, I, I think I've touched on it a couple times and, and, and different answers, so I'll keep this uh, fairly, short, uh, fairly short. Uh, I'm a career civil servant. I've, been a, um, I've, worked for the, I've worked in the government almost an entire career at this point. I'm fairly well experienced in putting aside my personal preferences to whatever the, the, uh, the issue at hand might be. Um, um, don't ask me specific questions about my agency. I'm not supposed to talk about them. Um, but generally speaking, I come back to my, my concept of this position as an ambassador. And, and, and that means not going out, taking in information, coordinating it, and seeing what the best policy to achieve the, go the best goals are. And that's never an easy, there's, there's not a rank order system that you can use. It's not best, second, third. You've got a whole bunch of ways to get to where you need to go. And you have to sort of acknowledge what is possible what is potentially possible if you do something else, and then you know how far you can go, you know how far you need to go to produce the best possible sort of outcome. So there's there's a lot that goes into it. I think juggling that is basically, I mean, it is sort of part and parcel to the job, and and part of the you know the ambassadorship is getting the information, bringing it in, collating it, and coming up with an idea and being creative and how you can accomplish what you need to accomplish. Um. There is um, a world of difference between bias and perspective. You know, my, my perspective on a lot of things is uh, gained from my lived experience. Um, so I, I have to take my perspective with me wherever I go. You know, how I see things is, um, is a part of what I hopefully contribute, you know, um, because not everybody you know, has um, had the life experiences I've had. And those things have allowed me to have certain perspective on, on, um, on how you treat people, on where you meet people, you know. Um, and those things are important. Bias, on the other hand, is, is a bit different, right? And I mention this because, you know, a lot of people can't tell the difference, right? Um, it's a huge difference. Um, the 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 role of any professional, you know, whether um, no no matter w what sphere of of endeavor you're in, the role of in any professional is to leave their biases at the door. You know, once you walk into the organization, you are a part of that organization, and if you have disagreements with that organization, you have to figure out how to work it out, you know, if, if possible. Um, that, you know, getting, getting past your bias is what, you know, what, what every professional does, I think, um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but, but, um, but using your perspective and how you solve problems is is also what is necessary in in every public servant's role. So, I hope that answers your question. We didn't consult, <laughs> but the, when you take on a public office, especially, even what you do as a professional gets now multiplied by a factor of 10. Because it's not about you or your client, it's about what's in the public good. Which is true for any professional performing what I do, which is architecture and planning. What we do can affect the environment for the next 40, 50 years. So we have to be very careful that we're not serving only the person who's paying you, but the community that surrounds it, the neighbor and so on. So now if you take that one step further and you're talking about a whole county, your responsibility, your ethical need to fulfill is to follow the rules 
make sure that what's being requested is within and enhances what the vision is for the county and the group. Your bias and your perspective only advise you your perspective, your bias is, shouldn't even factor in there, not at all. My bias is chocolate. <laughs> well, it's a good day for you then, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, rounding us out is Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to start by thanking each of the candidates for this um, surviving this panel of questions and thank you for your interest in applying um, and so um, this is the question I've asked to our other candidates uh, coming from the city of Gaithersburg um, one of the um, county's only municipalities with its own planning board um, so it does not participate with the um, county's planning process but has seen significant expediency with how quickly they advance master plans that make the city, also known as the biotech corridor of the region, more competitive to growing and emerging businesses. How do you see the role of the planning board as an institution of equity and competitiveness now and in the future? And how will you use your role to advance Thrive, prioritizing the green space and a healthy tree canopy? And we can start with uh, Mr. Kumar Bar Kumar. If you could turn your microphone on, so, sir. There we go. Thank you. The important thing is to go back in time and figure out how Ebenezer Howard first figured out that there's a town and then there's a country, and they're separated oh, by a green belt. We have a city called Greenbelt in Maryland, so we have a tradition of understanding that. The Greenbelt really needs to be preserved and expanded on by simple rules which say we need the green space to make each community quite independently identifiable. Like when you drive through Delaware, you don't get that sense. It's one continuous highway, uh, and you go through it very quickly. So in terms of your question, this is an important thing. The fact that Gaithersburg is doing it is good. I consider that to be a good thing, and what we need to do is to partner with them, see whether we can learn some lessons from that, because there is no central authority that can dictate to anyone. And if they have decided that they're going to have their own planning board to look at their own conditions. That has to be somehow, I think, fitted if it's in the county. I would imagine that they can't do it independently except in their own little sector. But there might be lessons learned to how it can be efficiently adapted to meet other needs and other places. So it's a long process that we've come for 100, 200 years now since Ebenezer Howard and we can keep it going. And the more people who want to participate in it, the better. We were talking about information. They're making the decisions based on their local information. We need to kind of give them the overarching vision that we have, which I'm sure they're aware of. Um, thank you. Um, so I kind of heard your question as, you know, how can we use, how, how can planning be a part of an economic competitiveness agenda? I mean, that's, I want to short, short, shorten it a bit. Um, the, um, so I, th I think in some ways we already do, right? I mean, we have um, areas that we have said, okay, we're going to develop life sciences over here you know, and uh, along this corridor, you know, we are, we are going to help concentrate life sciences because there are, you know, and, and then we, we use Montgomery College that's in that area to help provide workers, you know, and, and training that, that helps the life science industry. You know, we, we, we have a, a tech sector, you know, I, I don't know if, if Bethesda wants to be known as a hospitality quarter, but it kind of seems like it is to me. Um, 
so you know so i i think we kind of do that, but maybe not with the kind of purposefulness that it should be. You know, I mean, I think I think the life sciences example is was extremely purposeful. You know, and and we did that. The county did that for a reason. You know, um, but but then we have some other things that we did purposefully that we're now looking back on and say oh my goodness we did that I mean you know we we, we have all these office parks right and and now 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 the world has changed and people are not going to work in big office buildings and so and so you know and, and they're they're all there together you know in certain places and so we have to figure out now what do we do with it now now looks like we're trying to turn a lot of them into housing you know so so I you know I guess um, I agree that com economic competitiveness is a huge part of what we should be thinking about as we're thinking about planning. Definitely agree. Um, but I think it's also important to know and understand that the nature of the economy changes and it can change in a heartbeat. You know, and, and so, you know, like like we saw during COVID, I mean, brick and mortar stores, who wants one of those, you know? So, so, so things change and I think the real challenge is to not only allow and um, um, assist the competitiveness, but also to provide a certain flexibility to, um, to know that change is, is likely to occur. All right, I'll, um, I think I've touched on a few of these things, so I'll make it uh, fairly quick, but, but I sort of interpreted the question similarly about economic competitiveness and, and economic development. I used to do a lot of economic development work as a consultant and when I was, uh, when I was at HUD, and one of the things that, that we realized and the, the research showed pretty, uh, pretty consistently was that the two things that make, um, the two things that businesses really look at when they make a decision of where to locate is uh, do they have a workforce and is there infrastructure? And which ties back to something like the planning board where you can work on providing both of those things. And with the workforce, what you need is housing, places for people to live. Um, if you don't have the places for people to live, they'll go somewhere else and the businesses will follow them to where they can you know, find, their, find their workers, which is why you get those concentrations of places like Silicon Valley, et cetera. All right, so you gotta have housing. So I think housing is, the housing portion of it and the land use portion of it are just like directly tied in to the economic competitiveness and development. I mean, you have to have that piece. The other piece is the infrastructure piece and that's can the people get from where they are to the work that they that they want to do, or the or the you know whatever businesses has come in, and that is part of providing uh, you know uh, public transportation infrastructure. It might be sidewalks, paths. It might be a development that gives them the you know if it's a biotech, it gives them the the power they need and whatever they need in their in their building to do their business. So I think that there's a lot of work that can be done through the planning board to make it easier and part and most of it is with housing and infrastructure um, with the the equity and the canopy the tree canopy and the, the sustainability piece I think that developing you know infill development smart growth however you want to decide it 15 minute communities whatever your particular uh, buzzword is the more that you do that in places that have already been developed the more you print maintain tree canopies the more sustainable it is the better your stormwater management is in Twinbrook just over there we had big giant parking lots with no trees, only a few businesses that were left at the time. And after this Twinbrook Quarter project comes in, uh, we're gonna have more trees, we're gonna have better storm water management, and we're gonna have more, you know, more people for more businesses and amenities there. So I think there's a lot of work that you can do to do that, and everyone that sort of lives there is one less person that's that's far out in Frederick or someplace like that, affecting sort of the sustainability and the tree canopy and things like that in that way. Thank you, Council Member Sales. Uh, one of the difficult things about going last with this group is that um, all the things that you want to say are taken because uh, everybody has such great ideas. Um, you know, I think that the one thing that I would add is that, you know, I talked about housing affordability before, but a component of that is, you know, nobody wants to live in a housing unit that's not near somewhere where they can work. Part of quality of life is not having a massive commute. I've sort of got 
if I went into the office, I would have, uh, you know, like just over an hour commute, and I don't want to do that, so I try not to go into the office. But maybe I would be more interested in doing that, or, um, you know, workers who, who work at jobs where really working remotely is not an option for them, um, you know, having economic growth and development in an area where their housing is uh, is a big benefit to quality of life, and so that's definitely something I would consider um, in the approval of plans. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, that concludes all of our questions and comments over what has been a, a long process to put three individuals on, on the planning board. And I want to thank the four of you and everybody who participated in this process. There were more than uh, approximately two dozen individuals who applied for the three positions, uh, showing the, the depth of skill and knowledge um, and also uh, care and consideration for our community, the community we have today and the community that we want for tomorrow. And so I just want to thank the four of you and uh, once again remind everybody that this is the third panel. Uh, and in two weeks from today, on February 28th, the council when we return, uh, we will be making decisions and appointments and nominations uh, for the three planning board positions, one for a, Rep a Republican resident, one for an unaffiliated, and one for a Democrat. And so this process will conclude. Uh, if all goes well in two weeks' time, uh, you have certainly made the decision hard for us, uh, but we appreciate your honesty and sharing your vision with us. And there is nothing else on the agenda, colleagues. So with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>